Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another chapter of Experiencer Interviews. And today we've got another amazing story coming to us from the U.S. We have Kevin J. Briggs on board today. Kevin J. Briggs is an author and specializes in consciousness and the connection to ET and UFOs. His recently published book is titled Spiritual Consciousness, A Personal Journey, and covers 57 years of, ex of his experiences on ET contact and UFO connections. Kevin speaks to many groups of UFO and ET enthusiasts. They are always eager to hear of his interactions. He always receives a warm reception. Kevin has written articles which have been published in the Truth magazine. His published book was also mentioned in Psychic News in the UK in their editor's Goodreads section. He has also written an article about his ET experiences which have been published in the New Observations magazine. Kevin has also appeared on local radio stations and recently filmed for a TV show, Unlocking Your Limitless Life, hosted by Suzanne Schatzer and produced by Robin C. Adams. Kevin was also a keynote speaker in Miami at the Free Consciousness and Contact Experience Conference, hosted by the Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial and Extraordinary Experiences. Kevin was a speaker at the Consciousness and Contact Conference held in July 2019 at the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Kevin was also a guest on Whitley Strieber's radio show, Unknown Country, the Karen Swain show from Australia, the Kevin Moore show in the UK. Kevin has also appeared on Melissa Kennedy's TV show, The UFO Women, filmed locally in Florida. Kevin is a co-author with Melissa Kennedy and Edgar Yohate of the recently published book, Tap Into Universal Energy, Understanding Cosmic Energy and Consciousness. So thank you so much for coming on, Kevin. Well, hi, Mr. Gray. It's great to be on your show. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, without people like yourself, I can't get my message out there. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Well, thanks for coming on. And I know your message is a positive one. And I do love positive messages, messages of reaching out to everyone. So um, to get into your story, uh, can you get into your earliest memories of uh, you know other worldly strangeness that might have happened to you? Uh, yes, I can do. Probably my first... Uh, remembrance of the contact itself was when I was eight but it started before that uh, when I was three years old I was uh, my mother engaged a photographer to take some photographs for the family album and uh, the photographer arrived I was lifted up onto the family dining room table uh, for a better position for the photographer I understand and uh, uh, from that position I was looking out around the room and I realized that my conscious energy was in a physical body again so i was like two people i was looking out from the physical and understanding that i was conscious again in this physical body so that was my first recollection of this journey really and it has been a journey and it continues to this day and i'm now 69 my first actual contact i was eight years old as a child i was always uh, aware of the different frequencies that surround us. And uh, on this particular day, I remember it was a Sunday, I was uh, having a bath, uh, in the, obviously in the bathroom, and I felt that change in the frequency while I was in the bath. I looked to my right and two beings appeared. Uh, they were uh, both very attractive. Uh, both had long blonde shoulder length hair. Uh, both were wearing deep blue jumpsuits type garments, uh, tight fitting, and they had deep blue eyes. As I say, both very attractive. And they were speaking telepathically to one another, which I could understand. It frightened me to death, as you can imagine, as an eight-year-old boy. I just sit there, sat there and watched. And then there was a conversation that took place between them. Uh, I've come to know these two over the years. And the, the male, his name is Art, and the female is D. And D said to Art, is this the boy? And, and Art replied, yes, this is the boy. And she said, are you sure this is the boy? She he said, yes, this is the boy, I'm sure. And then she questioned him again and said, but look at him, he's frightened. He's frightened by her presence. He's small, he's uneducated. And she was correct, I was terrified. And, and he said, yes, this is the boy. I will guide him, I will teach him. There was some other conversation within that. And then uh, they both left. 
as I say, I was so frightened, I didn't get down to the bath. The water went cold. I was shivering. My mother came in to see why I was still in the bathtub when the water was cold. I told her about the two beings, and she said it was just my imagination. Uh, well, it wasn't, uh, and uh, I've had contact with them all my life. I, I'm, I've been told I'm part of their extended family, only my physical is in the third dimension and their physical is in the fifth dimension. And the only difference between the dimensions are the physical vibrations that they exist at. So that was really the beginning of my lifelong journey. How tall are they? Sorry, how tall are they? Yeah. Uh, I would say from uh, my perspective, uh, then, and from seeing them subsequently, uh, about six feet tall, both of them, yeah. Okay. Just human-looking in appearance, very tall, attractive, slim, uh, beautiful features and everything. So, uh, uh, yeah, just, but, you you know, if you put regular clothes on and they're walking down the street, you wouldn't notice any different from a, a human being. The, the male, is his name is Ort, and uh, D is the female. They tell me that they, that I asked them what they what they do, what's their occupation, you know, uh, and they said that they are guides and they are teachers. And they've been true to their word uh, for uh, all my life, really. Now, are you aware if the, you're the only human that they're in contact with? No, there are others. I met a lady called Rebecca Renfro a few years ago. I went down to a, a meeting, a MUFON meeting it was actually, and the guy was talking about uh, uh, the the history of the Earth and astronomy and uh, the planet and everything. It was very interesting. So I went down to look at that, uh, to listen to it. And I took a copy of my book to give to the organiser. And uh, at the end of the lecture and everything, everybody finished. And I went to uh, give the book to the uh, person that organised it, which was so busy with people around her uh, being uh, uh, chatting, asking questions. I gave it to another lady who I didn't know at the time uh, called Rebecca Renfro. And uh, she'd help organize the meeting and greet the people as I came in. So I handed her a copy of my book, which is uh, Spiritual Consciousness, A Personal Journey. And uh, um, she took hold of the book and I said, can you uh, pass this on to uh, Lynn? And uh, uh, because she's busy and, and I have to leave now. So she took hold of the book and then I left. As she took hold of the book, she had this urge to, or knowing, to open the book at the near the end. And there was a photograph there of Aunt D. She opened the book and she said, I know Aunt D, I've met them. So then she, uh, she got my contact information from another friend. And then we got together and she's had contact with Aunt D as well. We both had information that gave us confirmation of that. And I know a couple of others as well that have had contact with uh, not only Aunt D, but a group of eight ETs I'm in contact with uh, now. You know, that's amazing, really, to have corroboration from others. Uh, yes, it's fascinating, really, because but they tend to do that because what we talk about, what I talk about, my own experiences are so way out there. You know, even sometimes you question yourself, but then when you get confirmation, from someone else who's seen them, who's had a conversation, who's had a dialogue. And I know Rebecca Renfro is bringing out a book soon, and she asked me to do a little contribution to it, just a small one, and I have done. But her story is, uh, is fascinating that it includes Orton D. And, uh, you know, she even got the names and the descriptions, and uh, it's just fascinating, really. But without that, and I've had confirmation all my life. Very often I'll ask for confirmation. If I'm given, say, a download of information, I'll ask, can you show me a craft? Because you just give me all this information. I don't know anything about it. I really need to know it's come from you and it's not just my own imagination. Can you show me a craft? And a craft would appear immediately. But when, you, again, you do that all your life with different questions and things, it gives you confirmation, confidence uh, to speak out about it because it's in the memory now. And I don't have to, I don't read from notes and things. And if you listen to my story, I'm sure it'd be the same one over and over again. You probably get quite bored with it. But uh, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it, it's fascinating, but that confirmation is very important. And I now find that if I'm talking to small groups and things, I give confirmation for people in that group because they've had these experiences 
and I can explain them and I've had the same one. So it gives them confirmation. I had a lady the other, uh, a few weeks ago, about a year ago now, probably, and she listened to her. Uh, I was on a podcast and I was talking about a download of the quantum unified field theory. And as I explained it, she'd had exactly the same download, but she didn't under she understood what the, the information was, but she didn't understand why she was getting it. She didn't know it as her own imagination. But when she heard me talking about it, it gave her that confirmation that she was being contacted and being given information. So yeah, they are uh, managing the disclosure or the enlightenment of the human race in relation to those higher levels of consciousness and who we really are. Yeah. So you had these experiences as a kid. Did Orton D ever come back to you as a, as a child? Uh, well, yeah, my next experience, I was nine years old and uh, I had some friends around again. It was a Sunday. I remember the days and uh, we'd been playing in the living room, playing different games, board games and things we do then as, as kids. It was time for them to leave, to go home for their uh, tea, their dinner. And I showed them out the back door. As I turned around, I felt this frequency within the house. Uh, and again, I told you I was uh, I could detect these different frequencies. I was sens sensitive to them. So I went looking for them. I went in the living room, in the kitchen, upstairs, in the bedrooms. I went back down into the living room where the frequency was the strongest. And I was drawn towards the window. I looked behind the curtains or the drapes. And there was a uh, uh, an energy orb there. It was about four to six inches across. It was slightly vibrating, orange, yellow in colour. Uh, I now know that that was Ort's pure conscious energy. I didn't at the time. I do now. And uh, I was a bit perturbed because I thought I'd invited it into the house. And if my mother saw it, I would get into trouble. So I thought, well, I'll go to bed this evening and hopefully when I wake up in the morning, it will have gone. Uh, it didn't. It was. I woke up in the morning and I could feel the vibration. I went downstairs. It was still there. To cut a long story short, it was there for a week until Friday. I came home from school. I opened the back door and uh, I knew it had gone. I went to the window, looked behind the curtains, the drapes, and it wasn't there. There was no communication that I remember. But uh, after that, my psychic abilities had been enhanced no end, uh, and I was able to travel outside of the physical body just as pure conscious energy and as a nine-year-old boy i would just use that uh, locally to go and visit my grandparents usually on a sunday i just relax open my mind allow my conscious energy to leave uh, travel to my grandparents house which is about 70 miles away uh, the conscious energy would enter through the roof and i would sit in a, a dressing room they had in their master bedroom upstairs I would look down through the floor. The floor was opaque. I could see my grandmother usually cooking in the kitchen on a Sunday and my grandfather either watching the TV or reading the newspaper. And it gave me great comfort to do that. But that's the only use I really used for it as a young child. I didn't realise the full potential. So that was really what happens with, with Orton D. They will give me an experience and that experience is the education. They don't sit down in the classroom and teach. As I am aware, others are taken and, and sat down in classrooms and taught specific things. Mine have been one of uh, experiences, been the education, and the main thread throughout that whole education has been one of consciousness, shared consciousness, and that shared consciousness ex extends to our extraterrestrial families, uh, the higher conscious beings, uh, right up to the angelic realms, the really high consciousness. So uh, uh, it just depends where you are on that level of understanding. And they've educated me. And really, I, I understand. So that I'm able now to communicate with all the modalities that they use. I have an understanding of them. And uh, I'm able to communicate, as I say, at will. And vice versa. They contact me with telepathic communication. They ask me to do things. And uh, um, we, I'm working with them. They're working with me, and we're moving forward in the expansion of our understanding of consciousness itself. So I still find it. I find it very exciting, uh, uh, Mr. Gray, because uh, I'm 69. I'm retired, and uh, it, it gives me a new lease of life. Uh, and the only reason why I speak out about it, I'll jump right to the end and then come back again. Uh, about five years ago. I got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and uh, 
uh, I came back from the bathroom, I got into bed, I was just about to snuggle down, and a bright light appeared outside the bedroom window. The light uh, then came into the bedroom, it lit up the bedroom like a myriad of butterflies, uh, but they were just pure white light, sparkling light. And then Orton D materialised at the bottom of the bed, the ones that I saw when I was eight. Uh, bearing in mind, I'm used to meeting them and seeing them. After pleasantries, I asked what the what was the reason for their visit. And Art said, Kevin, we want you to talk about your lifelong interaction with us. We want you to write about your uh, lifelong interactions with us. I said, well, I don't mind speaking about it, but I'm not a writer. <clears throat> they said, well, we will continue to guide you. We will continue to teach you and we will give you information to include in the book. In fact, Kevin, you will write two books. And uh, I've written the first one, which I've shown you, Spiritual Consciousness, A Personal Journey. Uh, I have written the second one, but I haven't had it published yet. So uh, so that's why I speak out about it. If they hadn't have materialised at my uh, bottom of my bed five years ago, I wouldn't have spoken out. I didn't need to. I was happy with the interaction. I was happy with my extended uh, uh, ET star families. And uh, I've interacted with them all my life. So I didn't need, I had no wish to speak out. But I feel that because they've asked me, and with all the education they've given me, I'm just paying that little bit back. So, so that's why now, that's why I'm on your show, Mister Gray, because <sighs> they asked me to speak out. Huge thanks to Orton D. Then I will do. <laughs> yeah. Now, okay. So, you, could you do you have any like past memories of being with them or that people? No, I don't have any past memories of being with them. I do have past memories of previous lives, uh, particularly two in, in particular, uh, previous deaths, because they were violent and uh, a, a really uh, ancient, uh, well, in ancient Egyptian times. I, I have memories from there, um, but no memories of interaction with them, them other than within this current incarnation, as it were. I know there's some some experiences that do, uh, but but I don't. Uh, I don't think that's. I have a mission here. I know what the mission is. It's simple. It's straightforward. And I think they've kept it simple because I'm just a regular guy, uh, you know. So they, uh, it, my main mission is to share my story, which is simple. I'm happy talking about it. Uh, I was happy writing the book, and and the book has helped many people who have these experiences who can't talk about it for various reasons. And then the main part of the mission is to help to facilitate the reveal uh, of their uh, presence globally. That's the presence of our ET staff on this. So that's what I work towards now. And as I say, I'm 69. It gives me a purpose to get up in the morning and uh, do what I need to do. Come on, you know, shows like yours. I, I do enjoy doing them. I enjoy chatting and uh, I enjoy sharing the story because it does help people. Um. Can you get into some of the stories or lessons that they, they might have taught you over the years? Okay, well, uh, if, if I move on to when I was 14, okay. uh, I was uh, I had a, a paper round when I was 14, and every time I left the house to do the paper round, a UFO would appear above the house. And then as I'm walking towards the paper store to collect my papers, a second UFO would always appear, and then they would follow me around the paper round. And, uh, and then when I had finished the paper round, uh, one would usually go back in the direct, just change direction, go back in the direction it had come from, and the second one would usually go straight up into space. Now, when the uh, UFOs were there following me around the paper round, again, I was aware of that vibrational frequency that there was someone behind the fence, behind the wall, watching me, they were, were there. So on one occasion, I plucked up courage and I said, I know you're there, can you come out and show yourself? And two small grey beings stepped out from behind the hedge or the wall. I can't remember which it was now. I think it was a hedge, actually. And uh, I, I wasn't frightened. Uh, I said, hello, what do you want? Why are you here? And they said, well, there's a group of people that want to meet with you. Will you come with us? And I said, well, no, I've got my paper round to finish. I've nearly finished it. But I said, uh, I, I have to go to school. They said, well, you can finish your paper round. And then... Uh, uh, if you come with us, we'll have you back in time for school. So I agreed to go with them. So uh, I finished the paper round. I went with them, and I was taken to a what I believe to be a mothership. And uh, I think it's a mothership because of the size of the craft. The hangar 
we went in, there were hundreds of these crafts. The ones that we see that people have photographs of, the dish-shaped ones, the long-shaped ones, uh, all the different shapes and sizes that we see. And this hangar was just full of them. Uh, so anyway, we exited the small craft we were in, and I was escorted towards a, uh, a door. Uh, while we were there, there was a small, walking towards that door, there was a small grey, he was working on one of the craft. He waved to me, so I waved back, just to be polite. And uh, I, I, I met him later. I know who he is. I know his name and things now, but I didn't at the time. And I was led down into this amphitheater. The amphitheater was full of all different types of beings. And uh, at the front of the amphitheater, there was a, a small stage, elevated stage. On that stage was a table, and there were eight beings sat around that table. Now, at this moment in time, I just thought I was there as a uh, human specimen to be paraded uh, in front of the different beings that, that were there. That wasn't the case. I know that now. Uh, but then I, I was introduced to the eight beings at the front of the uh, amphitheater who were sat at the table. The first two being Orton D, who I already met when I was eight. Uh, next was uh, uh, Arna. She was like a blue bird type being. And Zach, he's a small grey, he's a mathematician, engineer. I've come to get to know him quite well over the years, and he actually teases my wife by moving her personal items around the house, much to her disdain. And then Ra, he's the leader of this group, this group of eight, and he's Anunnaki, he's very old. His energy is very, very powerful. And he looks like an ancient Egyptian or ancient Sumerian, those are his features. And then Tag, he's a tall grey. He introduced himself as uh, responsible for the security, not only of this group, this Council of Eight, uh, but for the security of the, this quadrant of the galaxy. And I hadn't thought about the galaxy being split up into different quadrants. And then Chica, I was a little bit perturbed by Chica. He was a very tall, over six foot mantis being, just like a, the grasshoppers we have here, or the mantis beings we have here, the small ones. Uh, but a full six foot size thing. And that, <laughs> I was a bit perturbed by that. And then Orla, she was a, a tall white. Her hair was uh, translucent. You could see through it. She was very pale in her complexion, uh, but very empathic. I think she told me she was an astrobiologist. And we don't seem to think of our ET star families having these disciplines that we have down here. But as I say, I've come to know them. Uh, obviously, I know Art Deep very well. Zach, I've come to know him very well as well. And Ra, I've had quite a bit of contact with him, not so much with Tar, Chica, or Orla. Uh, and the main education has come through Orton D and Zach, uh, and Zach. And then Ra's given me uh, jobs to do and things that they, they've they requested. So, uh, so that's how I met this group. Uh, so I'm 14 now and introduced to these different beings. What's the purpose of the council? <clears throat> That's a very good question. Uh, <clears throat> my understanding now is they are like our, say, like our United Nations, our uh, governments here who meet, our Congress in the US, they meet in like an amphitheater where the people at the front are the delegates that uh, are speaking on that particular day, and the other people sat in the amphitheater are delegates representing different districts, and that's what they were. Uh, I, I say I didn't know that at the time. I do now. Uh, so it's quite an interesting link now between this particular council, myself, and I know there are other councils as well, and I know that there are others that have contact with different councils, uh, but uh, I've only got uh, direct contact with this particular uh, group of it. I have met some other uh, higher conscious beings, some ETs, uh, but I don't have this connection, this contact with the, like I do with this particular group of eight. How long did the um, the your experience in the amphitheater take place, and did anything else happen during that time? Okay, well, I don't know exactly how long I was there, but I know I got back when they dropped me off back at home. It was about twenty twenty five minutes later than I would normally uh, arrive home from doing my paper out. So, I mean, I'm sure the travel there was just purely seconds or minutes to get there. Uh, so, probably about twenty minutes. Uh, on, on, I would say just time enough to go along the group, be introduced to them, 
And uh, so, yeah, 20, 25 minutes. Okay. So the, the whole thing, it was a, somewhat of a short visit to, to meet everyone. Okay. Yeah, and that's what it was. That's what they said. These two small guys. There's a group of people that want to meet with you. So they met with me. and uh, uh, But now I've got a lifelong contact with them, and I can call on them and speak to them if, if I need to. Okay. Have you ever had uh, the chance to meet feline beings? Uh, no, I haven't. I know others that have, uh, but I haven't, no. Okay. So what uh, what happened after that? Uh, did, I, did, did things like, can sometimes these contacts go up and down? They happen a lot, and then there's a, like a few years of, of nothing happening? That, that's true, that's true. I, throughout my life, from being a child, if I needed help with anything terrestrial as a child growing up, I would ask my extended family for help and assistance. But that was just normal to me, as you would ask your aunt, your uncle, your grandparents down here in the terrestrial world. Well, I did the same with an extended family. So it was just a part of who I was. And I got to the age of about 17 or 18. I had an apartment. I lived in Leeds at the time in the UK. And uh, I, I tried to find others that could travel outside of the physical body. As I say, I just used it to go and visit my grandparents. Uh, and then when I was 17, I, I would meet my friends and I think, well, I didn't have, we didn't have cell phones then. So I'd have to walk over to their home about 20 minute walk to see if they were in, uh, unless we've made some pre-arrangements uh, to go out. So I would just fly over there, nip over there, see if they were at home. If they were at home, I'd walk around to the house. And uh, so I would use it for simple things like that or uh, leaving my body to go and check on the line or the queue at the bus stop before I decided which way to walk to which bus stop and just simple things. And, but nobody spoke out about it. Nobody mentioned it. So I kept asking in the third party, I said, a friend of mine, he travels outside of his body. Uh, do you know anybody else that can do that? And I'll say, no, no, he must be delusional. Uh, so I couldn't find anybody. So I stopped asking them. So I asked Ott, uh, if he, one evening, uh, I, I went to bed, I relaxed, I call it opening my mind. I said to him, look, Art, I've got all this information. I'm able to travel outside of my body at will, separating my consciousness. I know there's much more knowledge, much, much more information here. Can you come and show me some more information? So he came, he took hold of my hand. I left my body, body. I looked down, I could see my physical body asleep. We went out through the window. We toured around the subdivision where I lived, and then we came back into the window, which was closed, just through the window. I could see my body asleep, and I went back into my body. I woke up that morning thinking, wow, well, was that a dream? Was it real? I wasn't certain. So I thought the second night I would try the same again. So I relaxed. I opened my mind. I asked Art. I said, oh, can you come and show me some more? I know there's a lot more information. He came. He took hold of my hand. Uh, this time he was flew further, we went down into Leeds, Leeds City Centre, flew over the town hall, the hospital, the university where I worked at the time as a technician, came back to my apartment and we went in through the window. Uh, my body was asleep, I went back into the body. Uh, I woke up in the morning and I'm still not certain whether I'm dreaming, whether I'm sleepwalking or what's happening. So I thought I'll try it for the third night. The third night, uh, Art came again and we travelled even further. And then I continued to travel with him in that way. But I did ask him on the, I think it was the third occasion, I said, look, I'm still not certain whether I'm sleepwalking walk, or dreaming. I'm not happy going out the window because we're three stories up and it's concrete pavement below. Can we go out through the roof? And we went out through the roof. And all subsequent journeys with him, uh, we went out through the roof. And then, uh, and then from there, uh, one day he came to me and said, Kevin, I'm going to take you somewhere special this evening. Uh, will you come with me? And I said, yes, I'll go anywhere you want to go. So he took hold of my hand, we left through the roof, and we went up and up and up and up. We just kept going up, and I could see the earth getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And then we went into a higher dimension. And, and in that dimension, there was a line of 30 people. At the head of the line was my deceased father. He was stood tall, about six foot tall. I'd never seen him standing as a child because uh, when I was born, he was confined to a wheelchair. 
his beaming sm face smiled at me uh, and uh, the feeling of love emanating from the group was just tremendous. And he said, Kevin, I'm going to introduce you to your family going back 30 generations, over 300 years. And uh, so we went down the line and the first 15 all had a, the physical. We spoke to one another telepathically. They showed me their last incarnation, what they did when they were in the physical. But when we got to the 15, 16th person, they were just a pure conscious energy of this round yellow sphere, orange, yellow in colour, vibrating. They could still communicate with me telepathically and they could, they show me their previous uh, incarnations down here in the third dimensional physical world. And uh, and that, I, I traveled that way meeting uh, with art, meeting them over a period of time. And then uh, a total of uh, over two years. But I got so confident in doing that in traveling outside of the physical as pure conscious energy, I could do it on my own. And I didn't need uh, art to do that or, or to hold my hand, so to speak. And, uh, but that was the lesson. Again, it was an experience he gave me. And then I took that experience on board and got confident and comfortable traveling outside as pure conscious energy. So I'd expanded from going over 70 miles to just see my grandparents to now visiting a higher dimensional frequency. Which is, which is just a change in the vibrational frequencies of the different dimensions and meeting with my past relatives who are now deceased from our understanding of it, our limited understanding, but clearly they're still alive at these higher levels of consciousness. So that would be a, a, another lesson in relation to using consciousness. And conscious energy can be used for communication, for travel, uh, for healing, uh, for education for creation and co-creation. And they've given me examples of all of those. And I've practiced them and have an understanding of them. Uh, and that's where we are heading as a species once we all learn this and understand the importance of conscious energy itself and what part we play within that, within the physical, then we will evolve as a species. And that's what's happening now. But we are being assisted by the higher conscious beings, I'm being assisted by the Council of Eight, the group of eight. I call them the Council of Eight. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there are others assisting other individuals, other people, other groups. So it's uh, I'm unimportant in this in the respect that if I'm to disappear, the process will continue. It's not about one individual. It's about the collective consciousness of humanity, really, at the end of the day. <clears throat> yeah, we can learn so, so much from them uh... You've got an amazing story so far. Uh, could you tell me if you if they ever if your star family ever gave you like a medical exam or if you ever had the chance to like pilot craft? Well, I, I can go on further than that. Really, uh, let's stick with the first question first uh, about a medical exam. I if I get if I get something wrong with me, I will ask my ET star families to heal me. I'm sixty nine. I'm healthy. Uh, I can't run a marathon now, but uh, but I'm healthy, I'm happy, and uh, I'm a little bit overweight, and I probably eat too much and drink too much beer. But apart from that, I'm okay. But if I do get something wrong with me, I'll ask them. One one day, and I had some, I had a couple of um, what do you call them, uh, like big brown moles on my left elbow and one on my right wrist. I'd had them for many years; they never bothered me. Just gross you get as you get older. And then uh, one time they started growing they started itching and bleeding so i googled them and it said on the google that there were melanomas so i thought well i better go and visit my doctor and have them removed so that night i went to bed and i said to art says look i've got these melanomas uh i'll throw my elbow and one on my wrist right wrist uh i said uh, can you remove them for me otherwise i'll have to make an appointment with a regular doctor in the morning and have them removed uh, i didn't get a reply i went to sleep I woke up in the morning, the two on my left elbow completely disappeared. No scars, no nothing. And I'd had them for years, just nothing there. The one on my right wrist was, uh, there was a red line around the periphery where it had been. And then uh, uh, by lunchtime, by 12 o'clock, that line had disappeared. So uh, from in answer to that question, have I been examined? Well, to remove those, they must have taken me somewhere or they came into the bedroom to remove them. I've had other occasions where I've asked them to heal things for me, 
and they've done that. But I've no recollection of being taken for medical examination, as it were. They've been uh, requests from me for healings, and I continue to do that if I get something. In fact, not just recently, I had my my dog, uh, Cassie. She had a tumour removed about six months ago, and then she had to go for a... Uh, check up after the six months to see if anything had grown back and there was a, a mass shown there on the x-ray so uh, we had to go and take her for a, uh, an ultrasound so between the time of the x-ray and the ultrasound I said to her the, can you heal Cassie for me or at least reduce the tumour or the mass as they call it, we call it tumour the mass because she's only 11 and I'd like to have her for a few more years and unbeknown to me, my wife asked as well. We took her to the ultrasound uh, one month later, uh, and the vet did the ultrasound and said, uh, there's no mass there, it's disappeared. I've never known this before, she said. I don't know how it's happened. Well, I didn't tell her that we'd asked Orton D, and I didn't tell her my wife had asked separately. It wasn't until afterwards that we got the all clear. So they do heal. Uh, they have these the technologies, of the knowledge of, the biology of who we are. Uh, so, yeah, again, uh, I needed help with something. I didn't want to lose my dog. She's 11. I'd already lost one a couple of months early. He was 11. And I didn't want to lose Cassie at that moment of time. So, again, <clears throat> but this is, uh, you know, if you've got, a, a, a say, a vet in the family, you would take your dog to that family vet, wouldn't you? You know, so I've just got an extended family that I'm allowed to ask for help and healing. Uh, which they do. So, uh, yeah. Did you get into the story where you talked about the uh, the reptilian that showed up in your bedroom? I can, I can do, yes. The um, uh, As I've said earlier, I, I'm able to travel outside of my body, outside of the physical, and you can travel anywhere as pure conscious energy, not just limited to the uh, 70 miles away to my grandparents. So I can travel across the universe. I can travel across to different planets if I wish to. And on one occasion, I was just uh, flying uh, just for pure pleasure because it's, it's, it's entertaining, as it might say. If I want to go and say, have a look around Mars, I can go fly around Mars or, or another planet or whatever. Anyway, I'm coming back towards Earth as pure conscious energy, and I landed in the back of a cockpit, not unlike this one here. Uh, and flying the cockpit was uh, in the cockpit with two small greys. They looked around at me and said telepathically to one another, What's he doing here? Uh, uh, I realized then I shouldn't be there. They were actually transporting minerals from the earth to the moon. And uh, I apologized and I left. I went back to my body. I woke up. And when I woke up, there was a tall gray there with a large head. And he warned me not to interfere. I shouldn't be there. Uh, and I say, just warned me to stay away. But then when he left, a reptilian materialized in the bedroom and he was he didn't like the human race he was ambivalent to who we are as a species he didn't speak to me he didn't say anything but i knew what he was thinking he wanted to know how a mere human could travel outside of his physical body as pure conscious entity how could he materialize on a ship being flown by two small waves and how could he understand telepathic communication that's why he was there and he was your, uh, he's the only reptilian I've ever seen. Uh, but he was your typical ones that you see in the drawings and things. But the 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 feeling I got from him was, he was just, he just didn't like the human race. So I'm sure there are very negative ETs out, just like on our planet, we've got very negative, malevolent uh, humans, uh, evil humans who do evil things to us, humanity. So I don't think that's any different. So... And I know people have had some very negative contact with the reptilians. I haven't. I've only had that one. And I say I'm, I'm um, very lucky, I think, because all my contacts have been positive. But I think that's on purpose because I, I, I believe and I understand that they protect me from that negativity. So when I talk about it, I'm positive because there's so much negativity. And when you think thoughts are conscious energy and they are uh, the creation of who we are. We create our own reality. So if we have that fear and creation, we create a different reality. Well, my reality is different to others. It's a very happy reality. Uh, I live in a nice area. 
Uh, I have a lot of friends and uh, I'm very fortunate. And I think by having that positivity with that thought and consciousness, those that can be shared to others and open up their consciousness in relation to who we are as a species and expand their reality. Have you ever moved around in, in a, like a UFO or a scout ship? Uh, no, no, I haven't done that. No, you did mention about have I flown? Yeah, flown a a, a, a craft. I can give you another example. This is only a few years ago. I um, again, I was traveling uh, out of my body. Uh, as this time, I was actually on the astral plane, which is a different level. And uh, I've met Orton D many times on the astral plane where we interact, uh, share information. And on this occasion, they came alongside me in a craft which was conscious. The craft itself, the skin was conscious. They invited me on board the craft. As I went through the craft, I felt the skin was conscious. Inside the craft was Orton D. Ort uh, appeared as a, a conscious energy orb. He was traveling outside of his physical body on the astral plane. D was exactly the same. And I'm there traveling outside of my physical. And I said to them, let me see if I understand this correctly. We're traveling uh, outside of our physical bodies on the astral plane in a craft that you've created using thought and consciousness. Uh, and they said, yes, that's correct. I said, well, I see you as two pure conscious energy orbs. How do you see me? They said, Kevin, we see you exactly the same as a pure conscious energy orb. So then uh, they said, well, Kevin, why don't you create your own craft and travel? And I, I remember my reply. I said, well, it's all right for you. You've got, you know, you've got D to travel with. There's two of you. And how would I create a conscious craft? I wouldn't know how to do it. And he said, well, you use thought and consciousness. So anyway, uh, I left. I went back through the skin of the craft. Again, I could feel that conscious energy. And I went back into my physical body. So this was really another lesson. So I thought, well, perhaps I can create a craft. I'll try and see what I can do. So that evening I went to bed, I relaxed, I opened my mind. I thought about creating this craft, this conscious craft. I thought I'll create it with a, a window so I can see where I'm going. I'll create it with a nice comfortable seat. Why I need a seat, I don't know. So I am thinking about this, I'm creating it. And then I'm in this craft traveling through the universe uh, through the window i can see these what i believe are stars whizzing past wow, wow 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 and then i had this thought wow i don't know where i'm going what happens if i get lost will i be able to get back so i ceased the thought experiment i went back into my body and then uh, during the day i thought well i really need a navigation system I need a bigger window because that wasn't big enough. And I need a bigger craft and I need a larger, more comfortable seat. Again, I don't know why. And then during the day, I looked at star charts uh, on the computer. So I decided that evening I would try the experiment again. I would create a, a craft through thought and consciousness. This time I would create a thought interface navigation system. So where I think I go. And then uh, I planned to go to Andromeda, and I chose that. So I looked where it was on the start charts. So that evening, I go to bed, I relax, I open my mind, I create this craft, which is a bigger one, with this uh, thought interface navigation system. I'd already got a plan where I was going to go, and I set off. I got to Andromeda. I went around this planet. It's a blue planet, uh, lots of clouds there. I didn't go down below the cloud, but I thought, what would happen if I went down through the cloud and the um, the planet was inhabited and they saw this conscious energy craft traveling through the, the clouds? Would they think I was a UFO? Would they think I was an extraterrestrial? I don't know the answer to that. I suspect so. So in answer to your question, have I piloted a craft? Uh, yes and no. A conscious energy craft that I created that our ET star families do and have those abilities as well. But again, that was one of the lessons. Uh, and when I went, I went uh, a little while later, I went looking for the Council of Eight because I hadn't seen them for a couple of weeks. 
I thought they were ignoring me. And uh, I tried to reach out to them and I had not, no response. So I thought, I'll create this craft and I'll go looking for them. So I created my craft. I went looking for them. I went to Andromeda. I went all over the place. I couldn't find them. I came back into my body. I uh, I woke up. And as I woke up, all eight, all D, Anna, Zach, Tag, Chica, and all of were all there looking down at me from the ceiling. But next to them was a full-size mothership. And I said, <laughs> in fact, I was a bit... Uh, uh, what's the word? Abrupt with them. I said, I've been all over looking for you. <laughs> Where have you been? So I'm telling them off. And uh, they said, Yes, we know. That's why we're here. And then I said, How can all eight of you appear in this small bedroom with a mother ship next to you? So they went on to explain. I didn't understand it. Uh, I'm sure there's lots I don't understand. But uh, uh, that's an example of using consciousness for communication, uh, for travel, for education, and many of the modalities that they use conscious energy for, and uh, I'm able to do. But I wouldn't have been able to do that. I wouldn't have even had a thought of anything like that if, if they hadn't given me the examples, the experiences of meeting with them. And that's what I said before. They don't sit me down in a classroom, but now I've got an understanding of all the modalities that they use. Uh, in relation to communication, creation, uh, co-creation. So now I'm trying to co-create with them the reveal or globally of our ET staff on it. But I have an understanding of that. I have an understanding of how I can do that. I have an understanding of how I can do that uh, with um, uh, their help with the co-creation. Clearly, uh, consciousness is a lot more vast a term that I've uh, I ever thought was possible because I thought that consciousness was more of an awareness of things out there of understanding, but it's a lot more complicated, a lot more. Um, yes, I, I, I would, uh, I would agree with you there. I have an understanding of it because of they, they give me examples that things like you know rocks, plants, trees, animals, humans, high conscious beings are all conscious. A rock is conscious. Now, for us to understand that concept. You have to really understand what conscious energy is. And in some of the scientific downloads that they've given me in relation to understanding consciousness as light frequencies at the quantum level within our quantum unified field theory, that our scientists understand. And you apply those theories to a rock, then a rock is conscious. I understand that. It might not be as conscious as an animal, as a tree, a plant, or whatever but it still has that conscious energy. And I was given an example oh, quite a few years ago. Again, uh, it was, this is in the dream state. I think it was a dream state. Uh, I'm not certain now whether it's a dream state or I was traveling out of my body. But wherever I went, I saw this young girl in looked about in her 20s, stood on a planet in like a rocky desert. And there's all these small rocks around her feet. And this is an experience that they gave me. And in the hand, she's holding a rock. And I introduced myself, and she introduced herself. So, what are you doing here? She says, oh, I'm, uh, I'm creating rocks. I said, oh. I said, how are you doing that? She said, uh, using thought and consciousness. Uh, she says, I'm just learning how to do it. I said, are all these rocks on the floor what you've created? She said, yes. I said, what about the rock in your hand? Have you created that? She said, yes. Uh, I said, oh, so what's the purpose of this? She said, well, she said, I'm just learning. I'm here, I'm new, I'm a new student. But the people who are teaching me, they can create planets. They can create galaxies. They can create star systems. That was a creative level of consciousness itself in relation to... I believe that consciousness is a true life form of the whole of our realities with the different levels of consciousness. Uh, and depending on your own vibrational frequency, you can either be a rock or you could be an angel, and there's many levels in between, I think. So uh, that's my understanding. It's simplistic understanding. But as I said before, they keep things fairly simple so that I can understand them and then explain them to others who uh, hopefully will understand what I'm saying. Have you met angelics? Uh, no, I haven't. I, uh, I have had messages from the angelic realms, from others that have been shared with me, I did once see 
Mary Magdalene. Uh, I woke up one morning and uh, I woke up and I looked, I just felt my eyes like on the pillow and there was his face there and I recognised it straight away. It was Mary Magdalene. And, uh, and the face was made up of the shadows, the creases, the sunlight coming into the window on the pillow. And I knew it was her. I could see her. Um, there was no communication. But I knew if I blinked, she would disappear. So I didn't blink for 10 minutes, which is an impossible task, really. I think. But I did it for 10 minutes. As soon as I blinked, she disappeared. I don't know the reason for that. Uh, but that would be an angelic realm showing themselves. But no, I don't have any direct contact. I know others that do, uh, but I don't know. Since we talked about shadows, have you ever, ever seen shadow beings? Uh, yes, uh, I see them occasionally now. I see them regularly when I was a child. They would, uh, um, uh, well, usually they appear, say, you'd be sat in the living room watching the TV. You'd see them out the corner of your eye. And then you'd look and the dart behind the furniture or whatever. So you didn't really see them. But on one occasion, I would be, ooh, be about 30, early 30s I was. And uh, I'd, uh, at that time, I was a police officer in the UK. And I'd done what we call a quick changeover shift, where you finish at 10 o'clock at night. And then you get up at 5 in the morning to go and start again at 6 in the morning. And uh, I came home at 2 o'clock after that quick changeover. And usually when I did that, I was quite tired. So I'd go to bed for a couple of hours till my wife came home from work. And on this occasion, I got into bed and this shadow person walked through the door and looked at me straight in the face. And they don't normally do that. And then he beckoned me like this. And I said, no, go away. Go away, I'm tired. Come back later. And he, he walked off through the door, disappeared. He came back a couple of minutes later and he beckoned me again like this. And I said, no, I'm tired. Go away. And I said, don't do that. And he looked me straight in the eye. Uh, anyway, I came back a third time. I said, oh, you're so persistent. Uh, uh, you obviously want to show me something. All right, I said, I'll get up. So I got up. I didn't get dressed. He went through the door. I opened the door, uh, walked through it onto the landing, and on the landing there was a beam of light, and the beam of light went from the floor to the ceiling. And uh, I would describe it as if you ever watched Star Trek when they beam people down to the planet, it was just like that, exact same thing. So I thought, well, you've gone through all this trouble to get me here. I'll step in the beam of light. So I stepped in it. As I stepped in it, I got this feeling of euphoria, total euphoria. And then uh, a voice spoke to me and it said, I am your father. You are your father's son. I didn't know who that was at the time. I do now. That was Ra, uh, the leader of the Council of Eight. And I say his energy is tremendous. And then the beam of light dissipated from the floor uh, and the ceiling together and ended up in my chest, uh, abdomen area, and disappeared. I still felt euphoric. I didn't go back to bed. Uh, I told my wife of the incident when she came home from work, and we actually went out for a meal that evening. And normally after these quick changeover shifts, I was tired for you know, uh, the whole day the next day. So, But that's an example of a shadow person showing full on. I've seen them many times. But I asked who the shadow people were. And I was told that they live between the dimensions, between the dimensional frequencies. Uh, very often they do like teasing people, but very often so the higher conscious beings will use them as a conduit for communication. That's what that's what they told me. So, uh, but that was the only time I had any direct uh, contact with them. Uh, there was no communication from the uh, shallow person other than him beckoning me to go and see this beam of light. So, yeah. Um, but again, you know, fairly, I, I simply just, I just take it in my stride. It's just part of my greater reality, part of my reality, which I understand is different to uh, to many people. So. Do you know where D, uh, Orton D are from? Uh, yes, they tell me they are fifth dimensional beings. Yeah. They are Arcturians from Andromeda. They are guides and teachers and I think that there are a couple. I don't. I mean, I, I asked them if they're a married couple, but they are a, a couple. They uh, are together. So yeah. Okay. Do you know why uh, most of us humans have trouble leaving our human bodies? Why do they have trouble? Oh, sorry. well. What do we have trouble? You seem to have a, like this sort of natural ability to leave it. 
Ah, well, I think what happened with that, when um, Orc came as that conscious energy orb when I was nine, he activated some of my DNA that allows me to do that at will. And when my understanding that DNA are just light frequencies, if you activate those different light frequencies, then you activate different abilities within that physical reality that you are in. Wow, amazing. That's my yeah. understanding of it. Yeah. Yeah. On this earth plane, have you ever seen ghosts? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, when I was a child, when I said I was sensitive to the uh, different vibrations around me, yeah, I don't see them as ghosts. They are higher conscious beings now who've left the physical, but come down to this uh, uh, level of consciousness, sometimes to give a message to a loved one and uh, uh, sometimes a message for me, possibly, yeah, so. Oh. Uh, since you're coming out, have you ever had, like, government officials intercept you or, you know, stuff like that? No, happen? not not yet. No, they're obviously not interested. I think there's enough people that are speaking out that I'm just one of many, so I'm, I'm unimportant. As I said, I'm unimportant in this. Uh, it's... Um, and they know that the ETs are here. They know about the higher levels of consciousness. They have all this knowledge. Uh, they try to keep it hidden from us for, them, for the control purpose of, who, of the population, I'm sure. But uh, uh, they know it's here. And I think in the past they've interfered with people. I'm aware that they've interfered with people. And if they do, then you know, that's the risk I take. Uh, you know, If we have to move forward as a species and evolve, then uh, if I have to take uh, small risks and things in doing that, uh, then I will. I said the the knowledge that they've given me is is tremendous, really, and it it needs to be shared. It would be uh, I sh I have to share it really because I think it's so important. Uh, and especially the healing side of things, you know, we're able to heal ourselves uh, using thought and consciousness. We're able to uh, do many things that's been hidden from us. And all we need is a guide or a teacher, and we can learn all these abilities. And that's how we are going to evolve as a species, as humanity. And that's where we need to evolve, because if we don't, we'll annihilate ourselves. And I've been told by my ET guides um, that we've reached this level of technology in the past and destroyed our societies, where we're on the cusp of that again. So if I can assist, and the, again, I'm not important in this, there are many who have knowledge uh, beyond mine, far beyond mine, and they're all working towards helping humanity evolve, become enlightened into who we are, and to our galactic history. Our galactic history has been denied us. It's been denied, been denied to us on purpose, again, for control purposes. So I still think it's uh, exciting times uh, ahead and... Uh, I'm as I say, I'm still excited in relation to where it's going to go. And I don't always know. Um, sometimes they'll ask me to do things. Uh, oh, a couple of years ago, they asked me to contact our United Nations and ask if there was a mandated protocol to receive our ET star families. I contacted the office of Nicholas Hedman in Vienna at the uh, United Nations. And I did receive a reply from his office. He said that... Uh, uh, at this moment in time, there was no mandated protocol to receive, his words, advanced extraterrestrials should they wish to communicate with the United Nations. So I wrote back and I asked him, how how would we implement such a mandated protocol? And uh, he said, you would have to get a member state to propose it, and then it will be voted upon. So, so that was it. I did that. And then about a year later, they asked me again. They gave me a specific date and time where this group of ETs wanted to meet with our United Nations. I believe, if I can remember the date, it was February the 1st. I can't remember the year now without looking at my notes. And uh, it was in uh, New York, at the UN building there. And uh, I emailed um, uh, Nicholas Hedman. He's the chairman of the Outer Space Affairs Committee at the UN and gave him the request from the, the group of eight, the Council of Eight. And I also contacted the office in... Washington, D.C., uh, Dr. DePippo. He runs the office. I was in the office there. On that occasion, I didn't receive a reply at all. I'm not surprised because when, you know, someone comes along and says he's got contact with extraterrestrials and they want to meet with the United Nations in New York on this particular day, they probably thought I was a lunatic. But anyway, it doesn't matter. That's immaterial. What's important about this particular story is 
uh, about eight days after I'd contacted them, uh, Terry Lovelace. I don't let you know, Terry, have you had him on your show? Uh, he'd, he'd be an excellent guest. He uh, he contacted me. I know Terry, I met him at a conference, he's a good friend. He said, Kevin, I've been given the exact same information, time and date, with the uh, ETs wanting to connect with our governments. And bearing in mind, Terry Lovelace is a retired assistant attorney general for two jurisdictions. He's a retired law professor, so he has some standing within the community. And he said, uh, so I told him I'd written to uh, Nicholas Hedman's office in Vienna and I'd written to Dr. Di Pippo in Washington, D.C. He said, well, I know Dr. Di Pippo. I will write to him and support what you're saying in relation to uh, the request from the extraterrestrials. And uh, I have all the emails. He sent me the email he sent to Dr. Di Pippo. Neither of us had a reply. Um so uh, Nick, uh, sorry, uh, Terry Lovelace decided to go around the back channels uh, within government that uh, he knew. And uh, <clears throat> within those channels, within his words, he got the pushback. So our governments aren't ready yet for that move, that transition. I'm sure they will be at some point in time, or if they want to reach out themselves. I'm sure they've got their own experiences within government. and They know what's going on. It's just whether they want to participate and help with that transition. Uh, but uh, the society will change exponentially. We're already having new healing technologies that have come out, which have been, which have come from our uh, ET star families, the EE system of healing uh, with, uh, what's her name, Dr. Sandra Rose Michael. Uh, she's the founder of that healing system. I believe she's now got 200 centers uh, throughout the US using light scalar energy for healing, activating the frequencies of the cells that are damaged that cause the diseases that we have. It's been explained to me how it works. I have an understanding of it. And uh, so she's working on that. There are many others. I've seen many different facets. Uh, so it's uh, really interesting where we're at at this moment in time. So, so hopefully it will uh, it will continue. I believe uh, your wife took a photo of a craft beneath a, wa a rainbow. Yeah, yes. Again, that's another interesting story with confirmation again. Uh, I was in my bedroom. Sandy had already got up. Our usual routine. Sandy gets up, feeds the dog, sits out, and uh, has a cup of tea on the pool deck. I get up and join her with a cup of coffee. On this occasion, I was just about to get up, and uh, I thought, oh, I'll see if I can contact the council of eight. I was unable to make contact with them, but I contacted a small craft who was flying past, transporting seven or eight small greys. But the pilot of the craft, his name is Tia. He's a small grey. He's the one that waved to me on the craft when I was, uh, uh, how old was I then? 14, when I was 14. And uh, so I knew him. I'd met him before. And I said to him, uh, <clears throat> what are you doing here? Uh, bear in mind, when I'm speaking telepathically with them, I get a visual appearance of where they are. Uh, they were in this small craft. He was sat at the front, and there were two rows behind him of these greys. So it's not just a telepathic communication. Within that communication is the, um, I can see that their frequencies that they're at. So I see them as well. So he said, well, we were uh, flying close by. And we were nearby. And we deviated from our flight path to come and see where you lived. So we had a little bit of conversation, and then he said, right, we'll have to go now, because, as I said, we're off our uh, deviated. We've deviated from our flight path. So they left. Nothing unusual for me. I then get dressed. I make my cup of coffee. I go sit outside with my wife, and my wife says to me, Kevin, you missed the most beautiful rainbow this morning, and I've got five acres at the back of my property. And she said the rainbow was 180 degrees from fence line to fence line. I said, did you get a photograph? She said, yes, I did. Then she said, you won't happen, know what happened next. Or guess what happened next. I said, no, what happened? She said, uh, as I was taking the photograph with the iPad, she went out of the pool cage, lifted up the iPad, and then took a photograph, then she lowered it down. And as she lowered it down, a craft appeared under the rainbow. She was about 500 feet away. So she put it back up and clicked on the iPad. Now she has a photograph of it, a little blurred, as they always are. Uh, but I've had some filters put on the photograph, and you can actually see there's a shape within that cloaked device, as it were. 
But what was interesting, and again, the confirmation, when we looked at the time on the photograph, it was the same time on the clock in the bedroom when I was communicating with Tia. That's the confirmation they keep giving me in relation to, uh, A, that's confirmation of the telepathic communication, but they're now including my wife. She gets contacted and she gets communicated with, and uh, it, it just builds that confidence in my own abilities in relation to these uh, extra uh, modalities that we have. And I've now been working with uh, Rebecca Hardcastle Wright and her Exo Consciousness Group. And they're a group of people just like myself. Within our group, I think we've got nine or ten, and Rebecca's got uh, four or five other groups there. We all have these Exo groups. We all have the uh, contact with our uh, different uh, extraterrestrials, different groups, different individuals, different abilities. So we, as Exo Conscious Humans, are... Uh, Really, I suspect the evolved human. This is where we are all going to be. And if you're interested in uh, uh, Rebecca, I think she has a, a website, exoconscioushumans.com, I believe. Uh, but just Google uh, Rebecca Harcastle Wright if you're interested in exoconscious humans and how we are evolving. So, like I say, it, there's many working towards it, many unseen, but we have to get the information out to the general public who are interested, who want the information that's freely available. Now, your book's available on Amazon, I believe? Yes, that's correct. It's, uh, uh, I'll show you here, Spiritual Consciousness, A Personal Journey by Kevin James Biggs. It's available on Amazon. Um, the sales are going reasonably well. People seem to like it. The write-up on the Amazon, I think it was about 36 the other day that I looked at, they're all positive apart from two, and they were complaining about the uh, size of the letters and the gap between the lines. So, but all the rest were positive. So. <laughs> and you've got a, a website as well, Kevin J. I do have a website. Yeah, uh, Kevin J. Just my initial J. Kevin J. Briggs dot com. And if you go on there, I've uploaded some other interviews, some information. And if you go, if you click on events and media, and then scroll down. It gives you access to other uh, uh, information I've been putting out there. And uh, one other thing I wouldn't mind mentioning, if it's okay with you, uh, Mr. Gray, um, a friend of mine, uh, Kathleen Madden, who I've been working with for a number of years, very well known in this uh, arena of extraterrestrials and ufology. She's written a book uh, just recently published called uh, Forbidden, Forbidden Knowledge by Kathleen Madden. And uh, in there, uh, Kathleen has put uh, a number of questions that we put to the ET star families that I channeled. And then she's uh, written them down, transcribed them, and put them in this book. So this is an outline of what the ETs are saying, what they're requesting, uh, why they're here. So it makes for a very interesting read if you're interested in the uh, uh, the group of eight. And I've, I've channeled all eight of them, uh, but usually it's been art. Uh, I've ch channeled Ra on a couple of occasions, and I think there's a channel of Ra on uh, at the Miami conference I did, and uh, I think that's on the yes, it is on there. So if you're interested in that, go and have a look at that. And I think that mentions the uh, oh the possible meeting at the United Nations. It's, I forgot it's a while since I've seen it, so uh, I think it, it does mention that. But that was before when I had contacted them. Uh, in relation to asking them, and then that hasn't happened. So now what we're going to do is, I was asked a few months ago uh, to create, uh, co-create a mandated protocol to receive our ET star family. Wow. And uh, so I wrote down the mandated protocol, which uh, they've requested. And uh, at the end of the protocol, Kathleen Marden, myself, my wife witnessed it, Dr. Melanie Barton, Denise right. Stoner signed and ratified it. So if I just, if it's okay, if you've got enough time, look, look at the time, it's 2 2 2. Uh, that's very, <laughs> very interesting. The, uh, I've titled it Mandated Protocol to Receive Our ET Star Families Ambassadors. I'll just read the last paragraph because it's the words that are important. It's the words that have the conscious energy, and words can activate those DNA frequencies that we mentioned earlier. 
So the words themselves are important. So if I'll just read it out. The second part is titled Protocol for Peaceful Contact with our ET Star Families. Creation, co-creation, intent for a mandated protocol to receive our ET Star Families ambassadors. I have been informed by my ET guys that they require a mandated protocol in place to guarantee their safety and security when invited to Earth for meetings, interactions, and cultural exchange. My ET guides also inform me that the reveal of their presence globally will come from a request from the citizens of Earth. We use thought and consciousness intent to create our reality. I propose that we as exoconscious humans have an understanding of this. We should lead the way with the intention, creation, co-creation with our ET star families ambassadors. This will be the intention of this proposed mandated protocol being co-created through thought and consciousness. Included in these thoughts will be the protection and security of the craft and their occupants approaching Earth while flying in our atmosphere at landings, meetings, at predetermined times and dates and locations. And then the last line, in witness thereof, the undersigned being authorised by their birthright as born of this earth. And then I signed it, my wife witnessed it, Kathleen Marden signed it, uh, Denise Stoner and Dr Melanie Barton. So now we have our own mandated protocol uh, implemented by the citizens of earth. So we now can reach out to our ET star families as groups of experiences, as groups of exoconscious humans, and uh, make our own representation to that first meeting. Mm. That's so beautiful. Um, like, do you have uh, perhaps another like story to end this interview, or perhaps a closing statement that you want to might get into? Ooh, a classical statement. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I I'm very confident for the future. Uh, I know my ET staff families are very concerned about the pollution that we have here on our planet. They're very concerned at the moment about Fukushima and the radioactive uh, pollution um, that's continuing to leak from that planet. And uh, they're happy to share their technologies. They're happy to help educators. But we, we have to reach out to them. They won't do it for us. We have to reach that level where we reach out and request a meeting as we would with ambassadors from another country. Only we're just extending that invitation. And now we have this mandated protocol which I'm sharing with others. And that is important because that's entering our collective consciousness. When they asked me to do it, it came in my consciousness and I co-created it with them. I now share that with others. So we are co-creating now a future event because we are talking about it. Uh, we have co-created with the ETs and now we're doing it ourselves. So we're on the road for direct communication with them. And it, as they say, it has to come from us. They won't just interfere. They only tell me they will interfere if we use nuclear weapons again, then they would interfere. And they said that they've already demonstrated to our governments that they can activate the launch codes of the nuclear weapons. And they've also demonstrated to our governments that they can deactivate the nuclear weapons. So our governments are aware of this. Uh, so uh, the next step really is this open contact. Uh, and then let's move forward, create a new society that we desire for our children, a new society we desire for our future generations. And this new society we will co-create with our ET star families. So it's very exciting times ahead, I think, Mr. Fred. It is, it is. So, um, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on today. I truly feel blessed. And um, Thank you. And to those watching, I uh, hope you enjoyed today's interview. I'm your host, Mr. Great. More interviews coming up, and I'll see you guys next time. So, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is Mr. Gray and thanks for watching today's episode. If you are an abductee, contactee or experiencer and you believe that your story could help others, please feel free to contact me through my YouTube channel email. When it comes to experiencers, the ET phenomena and the future, remember, truth will out.